Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Vantage Seminar. Today, we're continuing our series of talks about perspectives on Gawa groups. And we're very happy to have Jen Paulus talking about automorphism groups of compact Riemann surfaces. And Jen, is it all right if we record this talk? Yes, not a problem at all. Oh, great. And if you have questions, uh, feel free to ask them during the talk. Okay, Jen, please go ahead. Great, thank you. Well, hello everybody. And uh, particularly thank you to Rachel and Drew for the invitation. And I really love this seminar and I'm really honored to get to speak at it, um, at this particular series. Um, today, I'm gonna talk about automorphism groups of compact Riemann surfaces. And uh, the picture you can see here on the first slide is uh, the conjugacy classes of the alternating group A24. The alternating group will make a brief appearance in the talk at one point. Um, so if you uh, are looking at the slides separately, you can click on that on the picture and it'll take you to the database of uh, abstract groups that we have in the LMFDB for that particular group. If you are watching this talk at a later date, uh, I suggest you go watch David Harbiter's uh, first talk in this series. He motivates a couple of things that I'll be talking about. So if you haven't seen that talk yet, watch that and then come back and watch this talk. Okay, so the uh, plan of attack for this talk, first of all, I'm gonna introduce uh, the objects I'm talking about, a couple of basic things about them that I'm sure many of you already know. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk about three different projects that I have been um, part of that uh, involve asking questions about how groups act uh, as uh, automorphism groups of Riemann surfaces. Okay, so first thing first, we'll do the uh, just some introductory material. So since this is a number theory seminar, I'm gonna start with a curve instead of a Riemann surface. So take a curve, here's an example of a curve. Um, then we can see that the dihedral group, uh, in this case, the dihedral group of order 12, so D6 will be the dihedral group of order 12, acts on points of the curve as an automorphism. It will move uh, the points around. Uh, and I give you the two generators um, for that, um, uh, for, the, uh, for this particular automorphism. And this is called the automorphism group of a curve. And it turns out that this is always finite. Well, uh, projective, non-singular non uh, algebraic curves are also precisely compact Riemann surfaces. So in today's talk, I'm gonna talk about compact Riemann surfaces primarily, but I'll use the word curve somewhat interchangeably. And in that case, I mean projective uh, non-singular curves uh, to go there. And so I'm gonna switch over to more of a topological setting for a few moments, but remember that these are equivalent uh, uh, spaces to work in. All right, so uh, what is a Riemann surface? You may well know what it is if you don't, uh, and you know what a manifold is. It's a one-dimensional complex manifold. Um, if you don't know what a manifold is, it basically means that locally the surface looks like the complex plane. So we can do analytic things uh, because of that locally looking like the complex plane. I'm gonna talk about compact Riemann surfaces because those are what correspond to projective curves um, and Compact Riemann surfaces typically uh, are, are, are exactly these donut shaped surfaces or the Riemann sphere. So uh, the sphere or uh, a multi-hold tori. Um, so if, again, if you haven't seen Riemann surfaces before, you can think of them that way. And the genus is just the number of holes uh, in the surface. And that corresponds to what we think of as the genus of a curve. All right, so we're gonna have a compact Riemann surface X it's going to have a particular group that acts on it as the automorphisms. These are homeomorphisms that are also, con they're conformal homeomorphisms. So that G throughout the talk will be the automorphism group of this Riemann surface or the curve. Um, because the group acts on it, it you have orbits uh, under that action. And if you take those orbits as elements, they together actually form another, uh, another Riemann surface, the quotient. And so X over G is going to be our quotient. And it happens to also be, I guess, a Riemann surface. It's also compact as well. And there's a natural map from a point to the orbit that it happens to be in. And that uh, natural map gives us a branched covering 
um, that's branched at our places. So R throughout the talk will be the number of, of branchings uh, for this. Um, and this, uh, it's not a covering itself. There is, usually there's some ramification that we have to worry about. And so we will remove these branched points in the quotient and then their pre-images, the points where the ramification occurs, we remove those and we get a nice covering. Okay, so here's the picture uh, on the left that I just had on the previous slide. On the right, I'm just showing the sheets of the covering. So if this is a degree D covering or it's a D to one map, um, then you'll notice there's one on the right side, you'll notice there's one point uh, that only has three pre-images. So that's what we're talking about, a branch point and the ramification. We can re think of removing that from the surface. So we basically get punctured uh, punctured uh, sphere and up top a sort of punctured donut. Okay, so that's the world we live in. And there's one more piece of uh, topological information I need to give you uh, right now, which is monodromy. So I'm gonna explain uh, roughly what monodromy is next. Okay, so uh, the idea of monodromy is we are removing, we have some punctures on this surface. So we remove the branched points in the quotient. Uh, so I'm, I've highlighted one branch point here. There could be more, that little X in the quotient, and we've removed it. And we're going to take our base point, which I'll call P of this topological space. I'm gonna take a loop that goes all the way around that punctured point. And in covering space theories, there's ways to lift these loops up to the uh, top surface, up to X, this Riemann surface X. And when we do that, the point P, the starting and ending point of that loop has to go to one of the pre-images of, of the point P. So in this case, let's say this is a four to one map, uh, then there are four pre-images. I've labeled them here, P1 through P4. You can see those uh, values there, just put them somewhere on the, on the surface. And um, when we lift it, it's gonna start at one of these, the PIs, and it's gonna to go to another PI or maybe back to itself. We don't know what will happen, something will happen. So let's pretend that when we lift it to P1, uh, we start at P1, let's say it ends at P3, just as an example. We can lift it, that same loop in different ways to start at each of the pre-images. So I can lift it to start at P2 instead, and let's say in that case, maybe it goes from P2 to P4 and so on. We can lift this. That's gonna create a permutation of the PIs, of these pre-images. It's gonna create a permutation of that. And that permutation is one piece of the monodromy. And then we have to do this for the other uh, uh, branch points as well. This was just one example. So let me say that in words. So we're gonna take that blue loop, we're gonna lift it. It's gonna, that's gonna generate a permutation which is take, uh, lift it to P1 and whatever the lift starting at P1, whatever uh, pre-image it ends at, we have the permutation send P1 to that particular PI. So in this particular case, I sent P1 to P3, I sent P2 to P4 and so on. If you do this for all the uh, branch points, you get a permutation group and that's what we call the monodromy. And it's gonna connect to the uh, automorphism group. I'm gonna kind of skip explaining that, but it's going to connect to that um, as well. But we will need this monodromy, this permutation group we're going to need uh, going forward to understand which groups can act in certain ways. Okay, so again, here's the setup. I've got a compact Riemann surface. It's of genus little g. Big G is the automorphism group acting on us. We have this branched cover from the Riemann surface to the quotient surface. Um, and we're going to have something called the signature, which is a piece of information, which first, the first number in the signature is the genus of the quotient. So my pictures here, I've always had the Riemann sphere, a genus zero, but that just was the nature of drawing an easy picture. You could have higher genus uh, quotients as well. So the first number is that. And then the MIs are going to be positive integers, which give us the orders of those monodromy corresponding to each of the branch points. Remember, R is the number of branch points. So we're going to have the order of those. 
you might be concerned that we're losing some information here. The monodromy is actually a permutation. So it's not just the order, it's an actual cycle structure. And that is true. There are times where we actually want to record the cycle structure, not the order. But for this talk, I'm going to focus on just recording the order of those monodromy, uh, 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 the orders of these particular monodromy. Okay, so you can imagine there's lots of questions we could ask about uh, this whole um, uh, this whole process. Uh, you can ask which groups can we have as automorphism groups? Uh, what about a particular genus? What about a particular signature? What about a particular quotient genus and so on? So there's a whole bunch of questions we can ask uh, and that have been asked uh, and, and in many cases answered as well uh, about this. So this is uh, you know, all kinds of different questions we could ask. I'm gonna talk about little tiny pieces of some of these sorts of questions. Um, I'm giving a number theory talk though, and I basically talked about topology so far. So uh, let me try to motivate this question from a more number theoretic point of view. So first of all, Riemann surfaces are over the complex numbers. So you might be concerned that I'm just working over the complex numbers, but, um, but it turns out that these results that we talk about when we have automorphism groups that act in the complex uh, plane, we can really think of it as that group acts somehow uh, in some finite extension of the rational number. So we really can bring it down um, to questions about uh, uh, curves over number fields as well. So I'm going to focus on Riemann surfaces, but lurking in the background is this idea. I've given you an idea here. I don't. I don't want to go through the proof of it, but there's this idea. Uh, called the principle of finite extension, which says that if it happens in some extension, it has to happen in some finite extension. That is, of course, not a proof, but uh, you can uh, work through a lot of detail and see why this actually works. Okay. Um, the other motivation uh, is that understanding how automorphism groups work gives us uh, information. So again, if uh, David Harbiter in his talk uh, talked a bit about how this would give us information about inverse Galois theory questions. So um, you can look to that talk to know that. Um, behind the scenes here is the mapping class group is lurking. And so some of these questions about automorphism groups help us answer questions about the mapping class group. And then my own research, uh, my own, uh, the reason I've found myself doing research in this particular area is because I studied Jacobian varieties and how they decomposed and I needed automorphism groups of those varieties to be able to do the, de the decompositions and that's how I ended up asking all these questions. Okay, so as I said, these are sort of the broad general questions in the field you know, what groups can act, how do they act, what genus, what signatures, these are many questions you can ask. And I just wanna mention briefly that I have a recent paper with uh, Alan Broughton and Aaron Wooten where we laid out a whole bunch of open problems in the area. So if this does interest you, please check that paper out because there's lots, uh, lots of open problems going in many different directions there. Okay, so I've done a whole lot of topology. I don't want to keep doing topology. I want to switch over to something I'm more comfortable with. Uh, and group theory is certainly something I'm more comfortable with. So uh, one of a beautiful result called Riemann's existence theorem allows us to take all the topology I've talked about and turn it into uh, basically a group theoretic statement. So if we have a group that acts on a Riemann surface uh, for some genus G, that happens precisely when we can find two H plus R elements so these are the AIs, the BIs, and the CIs. There's two H. H is the quotient genus, uh, and R is the number of branch points. So two H plus R elements. Those elements together have to generate the group, and they have to satisfy this condition here, this equation. They have, the product product has to equal the identity, where we have the commutator um, in there. Um, and in addition, the CIs, the elements that correspond to the um, to the branch points, these are really the monodromy elements. And so they have, this is where the monodromy shows up and their order together with the size of the group and the genus of the surface and its quotient have to satisfy the riemann hurwitz formula. So we're saying you have elements of a group that generate the group, their product in this, this product with commutators is the identity and the numeric values satisfy the riemann hurwitz formula, then you know you have a group acting on some compact Riemann surface of genus G. 
some terminology here. Again, signature, same signature as before, first numbers, the quotient genus. And then um, the MIs are the orders of the monodromy. And we'll say that this element, this product of uh, uh, the, the set of elements of the group, this product is the identity in this way and which generates the group, that's gonna be called the generating vector. So I'm gonna do a lot with generating vectors that's gonna specify the particular action. We'll talk later about how you can have different generating vectors for different actions. Um, just a brief note to say that there's already a lot of work. Right? This is not a new field by any means. Uh, and around 2000, Thomas Breuer had an algorithm that would give you a complete classification up to genus four. His was up to genus 48. It, you could run it for higher genus, but he went up to genus 48 giving you all the possible groups and signature pairs that could act uh, on any uh, curve up to genus 48. Um, and uh, he has a book that tells you a lot more. And I'll mention that that data is also on the LMFDB and there's a higher genus section and that's where that data is. And I that's up to genus 15 at the moment. I have a lot more data. So soon uh, to be determined what exactly soon means, but soon I hope to have more data on that page as well. Um, and uh, 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 there's also work, uh, Mar Marston Condor has some great data on his webpage up to genus 101, not complete classification, but classification of large automorphism groups. So these classifications are pretty well known. There's data we can go back to on those. All right, so what I wanna talk about for the rest of the talk are a couple of different projects I've been involved in that get into these sorts of questions. Um, and the first one is a question of looking at a particular group and seeing how it acts. So instead of asking for a genus, which groups act, we're going to say for a fixed group, how does it act? How, what, how many genera? Questions like that. Okay. Um, and this is a joint work with Mariela Cavarcho, Tom Tucker, and Aaron Wooten. Um, this is a published paper. There's a link on the, if you have a copy of the slides, there's a link to the original archive. Um, copy of the paper, but it's it's uh, been out for a couple of years now as well. Okay, so let's go back to Riemann's existence theorem because this is a really lovely result. And there's you can think of this as two pieces here. There's the piece that says you need to find elements of the group that do something. And then there's a the part that says some integers have to satisfy the riemann hurwitz formula. Okay, there's these two separate pieces and we're gonna separate those out. So we're going to say that a potential signature is a signature that satisfies, just satisfies the riemann hurwitz formula. Okay, all we just, just, those numbers make the equation work. An actual signature is one where we also have a generating vector that's associated to it. So we can actually find elements of the group that satisfy the, all the conditions we need. These are not the same always. So uh, here's just a, a little example. Uh, in genus uh, two, sorry, two, in genus two, uh, uh, C9 has as a potential signature three, three, nine. The zero, again, that first number zero means the quotient genus is zero, and then the monodromy three, three, nine. But it turns out that that is actually impossible for an abelian group. There, there's an issue with LCMs. There's a, it's a subtle thing, but it turns out that that's impossible. So this is a potential signature that's not an actual signature. Sometimes it's really not at all the same. So if you take SL2Q for Q a power of an odd prime, then there's Riemann Hurwitz is going to be satisfied with a zero quotient genus and just a whole bunch of two. Okay. But that would mean that the group had to be generated by elements of order two. And unfortunately, there's only one element of order two in all of SL2Q for Q an odd prime, and so therefore, or power of an odd prime. And so therefore, this can't be, uh, this, these infinite family of potential signatures cannot be actual signatures at all. And why are we fixating on this divide between potential and actual? Well, potential signatures are easy to compute. Actual signatures are hard to compute. I'm not saying any 
uh, concrete uh, complexity theory statement here, just hard in, in uh, this sense of we're going to have to search through a group to find elements that satisfy something is a lot harder to do generically than determining whether or not some integers satisfy an equation. And particularly if you fix a group G and you fix the MI, uh, sorry, you, yeah, you fix a group G that will force the MIs to be orders of elements in that group. And then you really limit what your options are. And so it's very easy to list potential signatures, really, really, really large, high genus. Um, determining whether a particular group satisfies those uh, can be a lot harder and require really digging into the particular groups. So our question that we wanted to know was which groups had almost all of their potential signatures as actual signatures? So this would mean we wouldn't have to spend the time to do the group theory of finding the generating vectors. We would know that beyond a certain point, any potential signature you wrote down would be an actual signature. Okay, so that's our question. Which groups, so we're fixing a group here, have a finite number of potential signatures which fail to be actual signatures? And we say those groups are going to act with almost all signatures. So we'll, I'll use the notation AAS. Okay, wrong direction. Um, so uh, we start with. Uh, uh, the, well, I'll just call the order set. These are the set of elements, uh, sorry, the sets of orders of elements in the group. And we throw out what? Throw out the identity as in the order of the identity. And it turns out that the Riemann Hurwitz formula, as long as you're willing to let your genre of the surface or the quotient get very large, you can actually almost anything you write down as a signature. Uh, for that group will be a potential signature. There are a few exceptions, but there's pretty much almost anything. So when we're asking this question, we need to verify that these actions are gonna work for almost all of the signatures of this, of any form like this. Okay. And so what we determined was two necessary and sufficient conditions uh, for this to happen. So it's going to have this property, this AAS property, if and only of two things. First. The commutator subgroup has to have an element of every order in the group. And second, it has to be, the group has to be able to be generated by elements of every order. So by which I mean any one order, you have to be able to generate by elements only of that order for, for every single order in this order set. So those are the two conditions. I'm, I'm gonna put them on the next slide again. So. We'll transfer them over here. So these are our two conditions. This is precisely when you have a group that uh, acts in such a way at almost all of them. Okay, uh, I'll just say briefly, why is it necessary? Uh, well, the necessary condition is we just have to produce an infinite uh, family of potential signatures, which don't have actual signatures. And the first condition um, fails uh, if you let the quotient genus get large. So this is this, First case here where it fails is a uh, quotient genus, some non quotient genus greater than zero, and one branch point, just one branch point, and you can let that go h go to infinity, and none of those are going to be satisfied uh, because if you remember back to our Riemann's existence theorem, there's a commutator sitting in there, and you need that to have a certain order. And if the second one is false, if you there's a if you take uh, the signature zero and then a whole bunch of NIs, as long as you let enough NIs, that will always satisfy Riemann Hurwitz. And that's going to fa fail as you let the NIs get, uh, the number of NIs get larger. That's never going to be an actual signature. So that's the necessary conditions. The sufficient, co sufficient conditions took more work. I'm not going to go into the details of this proof. It, you can read it in the paper. But um, what we do is we have to exhibit generating vectors beyond a certain point. So the first condition allows us to exhibit generating vectors when the quotient genus gets large enough. And the second one gives us conditions to, uh, or, or the second condition allows us to create generating vectors when the number of branch points gets large enough. So between the two of these, we're guaranteeing that. And there's work to be done inside those groups. There's some technicalities, but that's, that's the basic idea. All right, so um, 
it turns out then one of the nice things is that non-abelian finite simple groups satisfy both of these conditions. The commutator is the whole group if they're non-abelian and therefore it's got elements of every order. That was the first condition. And then the second condition is that the group can be generated by elements of every order. And that's a nice little problem you can give undergraduate abstract algebra students. If you take a conjugacy class um, and you take the set of all elements in that one conjugacy class, which will all have the same order, that forms a normal subgroup. And since we're in a simple group, uh, we're, if that's going to have to be the whole group. Um, so we get these two conditions and therefore non-abelian finite simple groups Almost any way you write down uh, a uh, potential signature or beyond a certain point, any potential signature you write down will be the actual signature. Those groups will act in that particular way. Uh, just to sort of complete the story here, this isn't all of them though. So the actual, uh, the, the sort of conditions we have, are there are two cases where a group can have this condition. It's either a non-abelian P group or it's a perfect group. And if perfect groups are not as well known, it just means the commutator subgroup is the whole group. So non-abelian simple groups sit inside of that perfect, uh, uh, that perfect group category. Um, there are P groups, non-abelian P groups that are AAS, and there are non-abelian P groups that are not AAS. There are perfect non-simple groups that are AAS and there are perfect non-simple groups that are not AAS. So the picture beyond this statement uh, is a little murky. We have it figured out more than just this statement. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna take, this is a brief uh, statement about some very brief computational work and some ongoing work. So. Uh, and, but it relates to the previous one. So maybe it's not really its own section, but it, it seemed good to have a new section here. Um, so remember we had the theorem that a non-abelian finite simple group is AAS. So that means that beyond a certain point, any potential signature you write down, any way you want that group to act that satisfies the riemann hurwitz formula, the group will act that way. And so of course we can ask the question of, well, where are the failure points? Which potential signatures fail to be actual signatures? Can we can we list them all, say, for non-abelian finite simple groups? Um, so uh, at some point a couple of years ago, I had a bit of time, restless time, and I wanted to code something. So I thought, well, I'll take non-abelian simple groups up to order 10,000 and try to find the largest genus. So there's a potential signature for a curve of that genus, which is not an actual signature. So we know that beyond that genus, if the group acts, it's going, it, it, if the group could potentially act, it will actually act. All right, well, there were a couple of them that were annoying. So I'll say that I did it for many of them. And then this actually was a little tricky if the quotient genus was greater than zero. So when I ran these computations, I did it for uh, just covers of P1. So the quotient genus zero. I'll just show you uh, these slides, uh, a couple slides of what we uh, got. So for uh, the groups on the left, so these in the first slide, these are all PSL2Q uh, groups. The G is the largest genus where there's a failure. And then on the right are the potential but not actual signatures. Those are not all of the genus that I've written down. That genus is the highest genus. Uh, so somewhere I should have highlighted it. It's it's probably the last element in each of these lists is going to be one of that the, the highest genus. Okay, so you can see there's a few, but there's not a lot. So these groups act, uh, there's an infinite number of potential signatures for these groups, even of quotient genus zero, and they act in all but, you know, three or five in many cases. Okay, and here's two more just to round out up to order 10,000. Um, so here's uh, A7 and then one of the Matthew groups as well. It turns out that A5 and PSL2Q for some primes and some cubes of primes, every single potential signature was an actual signature if the quotient genus was zero. I'm not, that's not true uh, for high, if the quotient genus one. A5, for example, the, the signature one semicolon um, three fails to work, or two, actually two, sorry, uh, one semicolon two uh, fails to work. 
uh, for it. But for quotient genus zero, all of them, anything you write down, there'll be, it will act on a Riemann surface of a particular genus. And I'll just mention quickly that Aaron Moon and I are, it, this is ongoing work, but we're doing a slightly different question. We're taking all the alternating groups, hence the picture on the very first slide. Uh, we're looking at all the alternating groups and trying to ask this question, not for specific groups, but across the whole family of alternating groups. In that case, quotient genus zero uh, seemed to be out of, uh, beyond what we could do with the tools we currently have. So we're looking at quotient genus greater than zero. And um, we have some edge cases to finish up and a little more work to do, but it seems like pretty much any, uh, any potential signature you write down, any way you want a n to act uh, with to, as a cover of a quotient genus greater than zero, it will actually act that way. Okay, let me pause. Uh, Drew, I saw a number on the chat. Is that maybe just are there? Is there any questions, or is that just like uh, your links? Just links. You're all good. Okay. Great, all right, great. Okay, so uh, the rest of the talk, I want to talk uh, briefly about uh, some work uh, about finding examples of non-normal subvarieties of the uh, moduli space of curves of genus G, G at least two in this particular case. And I want to mention that this is so this is joint work. Uh, some of it is completed, some of it is still ongoing. This is with Ruben Hidalgo, Sebastian Reyes Caroca, and Anita Rojas. Um, and some of what I'm gonna talk about is in a paper that we've recently posted to archives um, and it's been submitted, but that you can look at that paper um, as well. It's linked here. Um, but before they do that, I do wanna uh, make a bit of a pitch quickly. So this work came out of a three month trip I took to Chile back in spring of 2022. Um, and it was through the Fulbright program, which is a program administered by the US State Department. Um, and it is a really great opportunity for faculty at US universities uh, and colleges to go abroad for a few months uh, to uh, visit one or a couple of universities uh, somewhere outside of the US. Um, and there's a stipend for it. Uh, it's a great supplement for sabbatical uh, or other options. Um, and I think a lot of faculty are not, especially in math, are not necessarily aware of these opportunities. You may have had students who did Fulbrights or you may have been aware of fac uh, faculty coming from other countries to the US on Fulbrights, there are options there. But I, again, this the, at the bottom is the link for this Fulbright Scholars Program. The applications are usually due early fall, but it was a really wonderful opportunity. I got you know three months uh, doing some great research in another part of the world. And um, because it's through the US State Department, a lot of travel things, getting visas, all of this went very smoothly. Um, and so, and there was like on the ground support um, in Chile as well. So just a side pitch, that's where most of this work comes from. And I think it's a great program and more mathematicians should apply. Okay, back to Riemann's existence theorem, but this time I'm only gonna consider quotient genus zero, which makes the whole statement a little bit easier to, uh, to uh, absor not absorb, but to see. So in quotient genus uh, zero, in that case, then we're going to have uh, uh, R elements of the group and their product has to be the identity. We no longer have to worry about the commutator part of it. Um, and they still have to satisfy riemann hurwitz formula. And the generating vector will just be R elements. Okay. So um, one thing you might ask is, what, um, okay, you have a generating vector. You could actually imagine that there's probably lots of generating vectors for a particular group, a particular genus, a particular signature. So are they all the same? Are they different? How, how do we define whether generating vectors are the same or not? And so that's where we're, uh, that's where, where our work sort of started was there are uh, generating vectors that do represent the same action. So for example, if you take one generating vector, uh, so these are elements in the group, and you conjugate them all by the same exact element in the group, you're gonna end up with another generating vector. Its product will be the identity, it generates the group, 
and the orders of all the elements will be the same, so it still satisfies Riemann Hurwitz. And so we get an equivalence relation on generating vectors up to, in this case, inner automorphism. So notice here that um, this, this conjugation, this is really just moving the base point uh, topologically, that's what's happening. And so we really don't want to call that a totally different action. We want that to be the same. A second equivalence that's maybe a little less obvious is something called topological equivalence. Uh, so I'm not, this isn't really the definition of topological equivalence, this is an algebraic consequence of that. But if you take uh, two generating vectors and they're in the same orbit under the action of now the full automorphism group, so I didn't say this, but on the previous slide, we can think of this conjugation that's just up to action of the inner automorphism of the gr group. So now we take the full automorphism group of the automorphism group of the Riemann surface or the curve, uh, direct product with the Art and Braid group. Uh, this is an infinite group, but it's finitely generated. So I give you an example of one of the generators for the braid group. You just take the CI, the ice and the ice plus one position, you swap them and then the ice, what was in the original ice position, you conjugate with what was in the ice plus one position. And these end up still being generated. The product is still the identity. They still generate the group. And topologically, these are equivalent. Um, I'll, the word homeomorphism will show up a little later uh, in, in the idea of this. So I'm giving you the more algebraic definition, a, a definition on the generating vectors. So here's an example. In genus three, C2 cross C4, just cyclic groups of order two and four, direct product, acts with a particular signature. In many, many ways, you can write down many generating vectors for this, but there are three inequivalent actions, and I'm giving you a representative of each of them on this slide. So each column represents a, a list of generating vectors, two elements of order two and two elements of order four, whose product is the identity in which generate the group. But these correspond to topologically inequivalent actions. They are not in the same orbit under this direct product of the automorphism group with the break group. So we have ways of being able to compute as long as the group doesn't get too big or too hairy that, this, that these are topologically inequivalent actions. Okay. All right, well, uh, where does this come into what we were thinking about? Well, the problem that we are thinking about and still thinking about is uh, more about classifying quotient actions. So if a group acts, on uh, a curve or a Riemann surface, and every subgroup will act in some way on that as well. And this creates uh, intermediate actions, intermediate covers. Um, but the hard, tricky thing is if I have an action for the group G, what I really, I don't just wanna know that there is an action of H, I wanna know which action it is. And by which I mean, well, in this previous example, let's say we have a group G, and let's say it has as a subgroup C2 cross C4. Well, which action corresponds to that particular group? Can we identify that? That, that was the question that, uh, that motivated this for us. Can we determine which action it is coming from this quotient? Um, and that, we're, that we, have, uh, we have an algorithm that we're working on. This, is still, this part is still work in progress, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little more detail. So in genus three, C2 cross D4 acts with this signature at the bottom, two, 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 four. And inside C2 cross C4 is a subgroup C2 cross C4. And this, the middle generating vector is the one that corresponds to the action of C2 cross C4. So C2 cross C4 corresponds to that middle action. In genus three, if I instead take a slightly different group, so that was C2 cross C4, this is now a, sem a semi-direct product, um, that corresponds to the third uh, generating vector. So now we have a situation where different group, if you look at the subgroup, they give us different, uh, different actions. And we wanted to suss out which, which one corresponded to that. And so we have an algorithm that in many cases will actually compute that. Uh, still, still some work to do in a few cases, hence why that part of the work is not quite done yet. Um, but, as we were working on this, as we were trying to find these examples and understand really carefully how the actions correspond to each other, not just the subgroup lattice structure, um, we came across some examples that 
that said something about the moduli space and um, loci in there. And so that's where I'm going to talk for the next few minutes about that. So it came out of these kind of questions that we were asking uh, about. Um, so it needs one more equivalence. This is the last equivalence, I promise, for these guys. Uh, and this is a conformal equivalence. And I do not have a good way to say how this relates to generating vectors. The previous two, uh, particularly topological equivalents, there's a way to say two generating vectors are equivalent under that action, specifically when uh, when we have, uh, if they're in the same orbit, under this action of the automorphism group of the group and the braid group. Um, but in this case, I don't have an example. I've asked lots of folks and uh, nobody has a good answer to this. If somebody watching this talk uh, does have a good answer, I would love to hear about it. Please email me uh, and tell me that, how you would see it from the generating vector. It is possible that you just can't do that. This is an analytic statement. Uh, and so it's possible that you can't translate that to the actual generating vectors themselves. Okay, so I'm gonna define this um, from the point of view of our problem of looking at intermediate quotients. So we take two subgroups. We say they're conformally equivalent if there's some automorphism of the surface uh, that so that one subgroup is conjugate to the other. Okay. So again, that's key here that they're conjugate to each other because we're going to look for things that are not conformally equivalent in a few minutes. And we're going to look for isomorphic but not conjugate uh, subgroups of a group when, when we get to that. Now, just to tie it back to topological equivalence, I will just say that you can also define topological equivalence this way, and this is actually one way it's defined. It ends up being equivalent to my statement about orbits uh, of the generating, or orbits uh, of the with the generating vectors on this particular action. But in this case, topological equivalent is if you loosen it from a conformal homeomorphism, if you remove the conformalness and just say there has to be a homeomorphism. And now you can start to see why this might be a topological equivalent since we've got the word homeomorphism in there. And so a key point is that if they are conformally equivalent, then they're gonna be topologically. If we have an automorphism between them, then we have a homeomorphism, but the opposite may not be true. You may have top, uh, topologically equivalent actions that are not actually conformally equivalent. And, and that is, a interesting question. What, when do we have this scenario? And there wasn't a lot that was known about that. Um, there still isn't a lot that was known about that. Uh, we, we said a little more, but I'll, I'll give you a couple of the sort of the historical uh, data of what we know about this problem. Um, so back in the early 19, uh, 1990s, Gonzalez Diaz proved that uh, when you have a cyclic subgroups of prime order, topological and conformal are equivalent. So if you are topologically equivalent, you are conformally equivalent as well. Um, and in the not late 1990s, Gonzalez Diaz and Hidalgo uh, gave an example of uh, with the group C8, so cyclic but not of prime order, that were uh, had two one topological action but two different conformal, in a, conformally inequivalent actions as well. Uh, in the early 2000s, Thierry gave an example for non-cyclic groups and uh, Carvacho in her thesis gave a family of, uh, a family of Riemann surfaces so that, uh, or, well, a family of groups of uh, order two to the n. So for the genre where they happen to act, you would get this family it was a generalization of the C8 example um, as well. Okay, but that was that's kind of the totality of what uh, we knew about this. Um, so examples where there was topological, but not conformal, what, what could we say? All right, well, how does this tie into the moduli space? Well, in the following way. So if we fix a genus G, a subgroup H of the group of automorphisms, a signature, and a particular generating vector. So really, I could just give you the generating vector. You can get all the other information from that, but it's helpful to have all these pieces written out, and that's why we, we write those out. So if you take one specific action, one specific generating vector, and find all the Riemann surfaces that are topologically equivalent to it, that's going to sit inside of the moduli space of uh, curves of genus G. And it ends up being a closed and irreducible subvariety of that. So that's what I'm going to call MGHS uh, sigma. That's going to be the 
anything topologically equivalent to that particular action. Inside of that set, so in the moduli space, we're going to have this set of, uh, of uh, Riemann surfaces that have this action in a very particular way. In there, it could be that there are conformally inequivalent actions. And if we look at just the equivalence classes under conformal equivalence, it turns out that that is the normalization of this, uh, of this sub variety. So if topological and conformal are not the same, this uh, sub variety that we define as mg of hs sigma is not going to be uh, a normal, it's going to be non normal sub variety. And so that's what we were looking at. So, um, so we started looking through, we want to find two subgroups, uh, which are topologically, but not conformally equivalent. So how do we do that? Well, we already have a uh, complete list. I mentioned uh, Breuer's work and Condor's work. We have lots of lists of groups which act on Riemann surfaces for particular genus up, up to a certain level. So we started searching through those and looking for uh, where we had isomorphic but not conjugate subgroups inside of that group acting. The G is the group acting. We looked at the subgroups that were isomorphic but not conjugate because that would guarantee that they weren't conformally equivalent. Now, they had to actually be topologically equivalent, and we didn't necessarily know that, but we have a way now uh, of producing the generating vectors in most of these cases, starting with the group. We asked, how do these, how do these intermediate actions happen, and what generating vector do they correspond to? And then we compare, and we hope they are topologically equivalent, because if those if the actions of H1 and H2 are, are topologically equivalent, then we have an example where they're topologically equivalent, but not conformally equivalent. And then we have a non-normal subvariety. As we were doing this for specific examples, we realized that there were actually far more, uh, that, that we noticed some patterns, basically. And so we were able to prove things far more generally for, for infinite families uh, of, of groups and actions. Um, and so I'll just give you uh, the next couple of slides are just some examples of uh, results we have. So in odd genus, if you take the group C2 cross D G plus one. So again, that's dihedral group of twice that order. Um, in every odd genus, we can show that that will act with a particular signature. You can, because of the nice group structure of this group, you can give a generating vector for this always. And, and inside of C2 cross DG plus one is a Klein four group, C2 cross C2. And there's a Klein four group in two non-conjugate ways. So, so uh, it shows up in at least two. I, I think there might be more, but at least two non-conjugate ways. But it turns out that in, and the signatures of those actions are, are zero and then a whole bunch of twos, G, G plus three twos after that. But it turns out that the only action of C2 of the Klein four group uh, with that particular signature in any genus uh, is in one way, it's a family of hyperelliptic curves that have C2 squared as their full automorphism group across the whole family. So this is a case where we have two, uh, we have one at two actions. They are topologically equivalent, but not conformally equivalent for all genus. But it turns out we can do the same thing for even genus. We just, you'll see on the next slide, I'm gonna put the word even where the word odd is right now. And I'm gonna change that C2 cross DG plus one to a dihedral group. And the signature changes just a little bit and everything else is the same. Okay. So this is for odd genus. For even genus, you instead take the dihedral group, acts in every even genus with this particular signature. And again, uh, the Klein four group is a subgroup of the dihedral group of order 2G. But it get, and again, the signature is uh, zero followed by G plus three twos. And that is, there's only one way that acts. It's the hyperelliptic, it's family of hyperelliptic curves and that's it. So, so these are topologically equivalent but not conformally equivalent. So for every genus, this moduli, so what we have concluded is for every genus, the moduli space contains a non-normal subvariety of a very particular type that's sitting inside there. Um, it, it, this, inside the singular locus, because that's where all these branched covers, uh, branched curve, these Riemann surfaces with extra actions uh, sit inside of there. Okay. And last example in my 30 remaining seconds um, is that we actually now also came up with an example where the subgroups are non-abelian. So all the examples before this, the subgroups were abelian, 
but you can take a semi-direct product of two cyclic groups. It acts in a particular way um, for every odd genus. Um, so this is not for every genus, but for odd genus. Inside of that group is a dihedral group that has uh, two uh, subgroups that are isomorphic to the, this dihedral group, but are not actually conjugate to each other inside of this group. And um, and then you, we proved that this acts in only one way up to topological equivalence. So I had to do some work to show what that topological action is, but then we get this and we have this example where we have a non-abelian um, subgroup that act topologically equivalent, but not conformally. Okay, that's it, thank you. Thanks, Jen, that was wonderful. But does anyone want to ask a question? Well, maybe I could, oh, uh, Sam, do you um, want to ask your question? Yeah. Um, I have two quick questions. So um, my first one, which maybe you'll uh, anticipate, Jen, is do you have any more uh, specific results when the number of ramification points is three for the list of poss of uh, actual signatures? Oh, uh, so back in the question about potential versus actual signatures, Sam, or just in general, do you mean? Uh, yeah, back in that section. Yeah, sure. So, um, so right. So this, uh, this was a slide I cut. I'm not going to go back because I actually I think I cut the slide. But uh, so, so the three branch points. In some ways, this is this is nice. Like Marston Condor's data up to genus 101 is all uh, three and four branch points. That's what the large really means. There's three and four branch points. So up to genus 101, and you could actually go higher. He uses the low index normal subgroup command in magma to get those. Uh, and so you can actually it, this gets. I didn't say this during the talk, but there's a whole world of Fuchsian groups and you can study those and talk. There's nice ways to define topological and conformal equivalence with those. I just decided to avoid those, but I'll just mention to you that that's, that's something. Um, for the, for the like, take the alternating group. If we wanna know if the signature zero, two, three, seven. So these are the, the Hurwitz uh, curves, the ones that have the largest possible automorphism group. So Condor and, um, someone named Higman, I believe, in the early 1980s, they have a, a couple of papers where they prove precisely when 0237 is an action of the alternating group AN. And it takes them work to do it. They have these things called coset diagrams and they really, it just, it's just work. Uh, and um, uh, McBeath has a similar thing for PSL2Q for certain Q and again, the 0237. So just taking which curves are Hurwitz curves uh, that that's generically a little bit hard. So, um, so I mean, we can list. I mean, we can list potential signatures with three. I mean, we just until you run out of computer time. But um, but like actually determining that, I, that's a big open box to me. I mean, there it could be that out in the world there is something we can do that's very nice, and, and maybe for some cases. But generically, those uh, the three points, three or four, that we're restricted in what we can do when the signature gets long, we can throw in a lot of stuff to make the group work. When it's short, we're really restricted. So maybe that, uh, yeah, so. Okay, thanks. Um, and I had one yeah, more yeah, question. Uh, so yeah. you said that you, you did a bunch of computations, but you restricted to the genus zero case for the most part. Um, so, but then you later sort of alluded to how if you, you know, if you mod out by the whole automorphism group, and then you want to know something about a subgroup, you can sort of climb back, you know, it'll factor the the map to p1 will factor and you can sort of try to climb back up this tower maybe is there some way to take the signatures if you know them for the full automorphism group and sort of you know parlay that into information about sign signatures for the subgroup h <clears throat> ah I, I think you're asking sam in this picture here i think you're asking and tell me if this is wrong Matt. if i know the signature for g do i know the signature for h yeah can yeah you, can you that we definitely okay sure Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, Sam. Go ahead. If if you have your list of signatures for for G, can you like lift those up and get the signatures for H? Yeah. Yes. Um. So Anita Rojas. So the the re, the reference I know for that is Anita Rojas in her PhD thesis. That's what she actually did was give the. Uh, it's even more. I'm pretty sure it's even more than that, and that she's giving the uh the actual monodromy. Like she's giving the cycle structure of of that as well. Um. 
And so, yes, that the signature is a little, I mean, I, I think I even have magma code and I think she has some code that will like, for you just throw in what you want and it'll say, oh, I know the signature of G. Okay. I get the signature of H. The harder part is knowing which, which acts. And that's, that's the thing we're trying to understand. So, yeah. And uh, Sam, I'm happy, you know, email me. I'm happy to send you uh, links to stuff too. So, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, David, do you have a question? Yeah, so uh, you had uh, a proof um, earlier in the talk about uh, if um, that, sorry, I'm not, not remembering exactly the notation. Yeah, no, no. Um, if you go, I was just wondering about effectiveness. So you said that you could go, um, you could increase the number of uh, terms in the signature, or you could increase the, the, in, the in I. And then later on, you said, well, for some specific simple groups, we could figure out the, the kind of exact things that were potential signatures, but not actual signatures. I was wondering if the, the proof more generally for, for AAS was explicit, if there were some bounds. Ah, uh, yes. So it is, a, oops, uh, rather so, oh, I just stopped sharing my screen. Yes, sorry. I went the wrong direction. Uh, let me say that again. Okay. Um, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So let me go back to those slides. Yeah. So here. So the yeah, the procedure in two. I can. Yeah. So oh no, that's the this one here, the positive yeah. one. Yeah. yeah so exactly. the procedure for the second one is basically you um take a bit of the signature you want. So take the first couple of you know you want a two and a three, and then. Yeah let's say you want a bunch of fives after that. So your signature is two, three, and then a bunch of fives. So what we do is we take the elements of order two and three, we write them as products of elements of order five, because we know that everything in the group can be written as elements of order five. And then we unwrap that uh, uh, the rest of the way across the signature. So so yes, in theory, we could go in and, uh, you know, and even the, and the same thing for the first thing, we, you could go and, find these bounds. I don't, we, we did not do that. And I'm not sure how, um, how realistic they are. I think the answer may be much, uh, we are sort of, you know, we're, we're doing it, it works, but uh, in, in for those, the examples I computed for non-abelian finite simple, we are way below where those bounds would end up being. So, yeah. Cool, thanks. I have a question that may be a little related to David's one. Uh, when you were working back with those largest genuses for which the um, the, the the signatures didn't show up, um, is yeah. it are those rare numbers the ones that don't show up, or is it that every genus like up to that point is unlikely to to it has a potential oh. but not actual signature? Yeah, yeah. So. Um... Uh, I I haven't looked at the data in a while, but I'm pretty sure just based on these numbers, like take PSL 216 with this 817. So I have four signatures that fail here, but there must be a bunch of other, uh, like back to Sam's question of the three uh, three ramification points, there must be a bunch of other ones in there that that are somewhere in that that range. So it is not that they all fail, it's that some of them fail. So in this particular case, it's like the fives are the problem. So if I had a bunch of twos, I, I don't, I can't, don't remember off the top of my head what PSL 216 has as orders, but it, twos and fours, those seem to be fine. It seems to be these one of five. So it is not that it fails for all and then it starts working. Uh, it's, it could work for some or earlier, and then there's there's some that it fails, and then eventually past that it keeps working. Uh, what I did to compute these was, uh, you know, if you have like a three, four, 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 sorry, if you have three, four, four that does work, then three, four, four, four is going to work as well. Uh, and if you have a six in there, then you can split that into an element of order two and three, for example. So there's a lot of little tricks you can do. This maybe gets back to David Rose's question, like, 
there's lots of ways that I think you can make this much smaller than the bound is because once you get one signature that does work, you start getting a lot more that do, that can, that will work uh, that are larger than it. And you more just have to worry about a few, the few remaining edge cases where it doesn't work. I don't know if that, did that answer your question, Rachel? Um, yeah, yeah, that answers the question. Thank you. Let's see, any other questions here? Okay, well, let's thank Jen again. Thank you. And our Thank next talk will be December 5th with Daniel Litt.